I want to talk to you first about a couple of comments you were making earlier this morning here at WEF. Um, you obviously are somebody who is very deeply sourced in Washington. You have long, uh, deep connections there. And your sense of things right now is that the government shutdown will be over in a matter of days and that the trade talks with China will be resolved in a matter of months. Of course, when you make a prediction, you're always uh, going to subject to looking foolish uh, if it doesn't come through. So I probably shouldn't have been so precise. But here's my view. Uh, the members of Congress and the people in the administration know that this is hurting the economy, the shutdown, and they really want to resolve this. And I think there's a real, res real resolve to get it resolved very quickly. So it could be more than a few days. It could be very soon, but it's not going to go on for a month or so, in my view. But on the government shutdown, in particular, before we move on to the trade talks, is, is that because both sides are going to be willing to reach some sort of a co compromise? Both sides recognize this is not in the country's interest. Both sides recognize that something has to be done. And there's going to be much political um, backlash against both sides if something isn't done soon. That's the general sense that people in Congress have, people in the White House have as well. What do you think that give looks like on either side? It could be many different things. Uh, one idea that I've had, but of course my idea isn't going to get anywhere probably, is you do what you normally do in these situations. Appoint a presidential commission to study it. Get a Democrat who has uh, homeland security experience. Get a Republican who has homeland security experience. Get them together. Ask them to come back in 75 days with some recommendation on what to do. And you keep the government closed that whole time? No, you keep it open that time. That, that would be an idea. Yeah. And, it, and, and that's, that's one possibility. You could also say Congress will pass legislation. The president won't like it. He won't sign it, but it'll still go into law. Under the Constitution, the president doesn't have to sign legislation. It can still go into law. Oh, he just doesn't veto it? He doesn't veto it. It still goes in law in 10 days. I didn't realize that. Yes, that's in the Constitution. So you could do that as well. The president can say, I don't support this legislation. I'm not going to sign it, but I'll let it go into law. 75 days later, we'll have a report. That's possible. Now, nobody is certain that what's going to happen, but I just think something will happen relatively soon. I think it'd be good has for the country. Has that ever happened it before? Happen. It's in the Constitution, but has that Oh, yes. Uh, I worked in the Carter administration. One time, President Carter didn't like one of the bills, but he didn't sign it, but it went into law. And I think other presidents have done that before. It's right in the Constitution. Huh. Uh, what about back to the idea of these trade talks with China? Why, where and how do you think we get to some sort of resolution? I months? think initially the Chinese weren't sure that President Trump really um, meant what he said about being tough on, on trade because he was very polite to Xi Jinping. They now realize, in my view, that he's very serious about this. And they also realize this, that if he were to depart tomorrow, there is somebody behind him who supports the same views. In other words, his views are probably the views of 40 percent or 45 percent of American people. So they realize that if, if the Trump goes away tomorrow, they're still going to have to deal with somebody in his place who will have the same views. So they want to get this resolved because it has to get done by somebody or with somebody. So they want to get it resolved. They just want to make sure they know what the Americans really want. Americans have not been certain exactly what they want now. I think they have one person as the point person on the, on the negotiations. I think that's going to be very helpful. Let's talk about the Fed. Uh, the interview that you did very recently with Jay Powell, uh, I thought was an incredible interview. He felt very comfortable with you and was willing to open up. And by the way, he's a Fed chairman who I think David Wessel said recently speaks English as a first language instead of economics as a first language. So it's easy to get a lot back and forth from him. But he felt very comfortable with you. What was your takeaway after that conversation in terms of what we should expect from the Fed this year? I think he tried to make it clear as he could that probably the expectation of two increases this year should be off the table for the time being. There was a general expectation last year that you'd have two Fed increases, two uh, 25 basis point increases probably early in the year. I think his view was probably you shouldn't assume that's going to happen right now. That's what his main message was, in my view. And, and he didn't, he probably was re reciting Keynes or whatever. What, what do you do when the facts change, sir? You change. He, he doesn't feel that he was necessarily wrong with the facts that he had in October. He just feels like at this point, with the knowledge of everything that's happened since then, now it makes less sense to 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 speak like he was speaking. In a, see, I would think that he would feel a bit of I don't know, feel embarrassed about sort of uh, retracing his comments and his no. steps. Or he could say the facts have changed, and this is where I am now. And what do you do when when the facts change? When when with you, sir? What what do you do? Um, I've lived in Washington for about forty years. I've never met a public figure who's embarrassed by something they said before. They usually say, well, the facts have changed right. or the situation is different. So usually they don't say, I really made a terrible mistake. I'm not saying he's, he feels that. But the circumstances did change, and I, I think he wanted to clarify it. So I think the facts are a little bit different. But if you're a good forecast, I mean, I, I wish we had the greatest forecaster on the planet as the chairman of the Fed, not the worst forecaster on the planet. So to know something in October, to be the last one to find to something fair, out. I don't think well, he's, but he's near not, the far. That's by, what I mean. Far, to be the last one to find well, something out. The chairman, is not the chairman what of the really, Federal Reserve, his main job or her main job 
is to make sure they get a consensus, and getting a consensus isn't that easy sometimes. So he has to make sure he's got people to go along with him. That they kind of call the show, though, don't they? They generally get the way they want, but they have to bring people along. And if you're the only person that supports something and nobody else supports you, you're not going to get your vote. So the votes that were taken before were supported unanimously by the Fed. David, let me ask you about uh, investments, Carlisle Investments. Yes. Uh, given this environment now, is this a, a time to continue to try to harvest before the, the great recession that Ray Dalio says is coming in 2020? Or are you actually out there buying stuff? Well, we are making some large investments. We think we're doing them at reasonable prices and we're financing them appropriately. Uh, I, we haven't stopped investing, but clearly we are trying to sell some things because it is a good time to harvest in certain areas. Uh, sometimes we've made investments recently in some large buyouts. We think they'll, in five or six years they'll be very good investments, but they'll take some time. And there might be a dip in, in for a while. For example, we've made some investments in China, and probably there's been a de devalue of some of those investments. That's, that's where I wanted to go term. next, which is in terms of your investing in China, in, in, uh, I was going to say in other emerging markets. China's not, a, not even an emerging market well, anymore. The um, biggest economy in the exactly. world. Exactly. Um, are there places where you're less uh, convinced that you can make investments? I mean, you, you guys were out there investing in Russia a long time ago, very early on. We, we were in, in Russia, and we're, we are still in Africa. We're in Latin America. Uh, we're in Southeast Asia. Emerging markets, the theory of emerging market investments is the prices are lower, the growth rates will be higher, and the profits will be higher. Now, it turns out over the last 20 years that emerging market uh, IRRs are roughly the same as developed market IRRs. So there's no premium you're really getting in the emerging markets. Now, that could change, and individual deals could be much better. But generally, you're going to get the same rate of return historically in the developed markets as in the On emerging China, markets. On China, though, in terms of the politics of the moment, do you find it any more complicated, challenging to buy something there than it was even six months ago or a year ago? I often think the greatest political risk is in a country that you and I are very familiar with, this country. So it's Switzerland you know, or America? I'm sorry? Switzerland or America? Uh, I'm sorry. Well, actually, I meant to say the United States. The United States is a country where sometimes you can't predict what people are going to do. Remember the famous Dubai ports uh, case? Yep. So sometimes the United States has political risks that you can't anticipate. Now, there are greater uh, corruption issues, uh, lack of uh, good management issues, um, disclosure issues in the emerging markets, and the exit opportunities are fewer. But surely uh, we recognize that from time to time the U.S. government does things that are hard to predict in advance. So there's political risks everywhere, and you're taking long-term investments, you know, six, seven, eight-year investments. You don't have to worry about that quite as much as if you're making trading investments where everything that happens every day is very important in terms of the value of your investment.